Recently, we lost to the legendary Bill Russell, the leader of the most dominant dynasty in NBA history. But the question on my mind is out of his 11 championship Celtic squads, which was the best individual team? Many people cite the 1965 Celtics as the greatest Bill Russell team. Today, we're going to find out just how good they really were. The Celtics had just won their sixth straight championship in 1964. It goes without saying that the leader of the 1965 Celtics was the 30-year-old Bill Russell. What is there to say about Bill Russell that hasn't been said already? 11 rings in 13 years. And in one of the two seasons Russell didn't win, he was injured in the finals. So a healthy Bill Russell really only lost one playoff series in his career. That's insane. This season, he led the league in rebounds with 24.1 per game. He also had the second most assists on the Celtics with 5.3 per game. At the time, it was the most assists per game by a center in a season. If blocks were tracked at this time, he may have led the league in those as well. Russell was named the 1965 league MVP and was also named first team All-NBA. If the DPOY had existed, he likely would have won that, since he once again led the league in defensive win shares. At shooting guard, the Celtics had the underrated Hall of Famer Sam Jones. He was a five-time All-Star, made three All-NBA teams, and won 10 championships. The second most in league history. Sam was the Celtics' leading scorer with 25.9 points, 5.1 rebounds, and 2.8 assists. Jerry West is often cited as the most clutch player of the 60s, and rightly so, but in my opinion, Sam Jones isn't too far behind. He was nicknamed Mr. Clutch, as he never let high-pressure situations affect him. When the game was down to the wire, Sam was the guy that the Celtics wanted to have the ball. He made the All-Star game in second-team All-NBA this year, and even though Russell won MVP, Sam finished fourth in that year's MVP voting. At small forward, the team had Hall of Famer Tom Heinsohn. Heinsohn, also known as Tommy Gun, had been a power forward for the Celtics since 1957, but he was moved to the three spot this season. He was a six-time All-Star, an eight-time champion, the 1957 Rookie of the Year, and made second team All-NBA four times. Heinsohn loved to use the hook shot, but he also scored a lot using his jump shot. He didn't often settle for good shots, which led to low field goal percentages, but Heinsohn really didn't care. Apparently, he was the Celtic that took the most abuse from Red Auerbach at practice, but Heinsohn was mentally strong. This year, he put up 13.6 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.3 assists. This would be the last year of Heinsohn's career. He retired as a player at 30 years old. At power forward, the team had Hall of Famer Tom Satch Sanders. Sanders had usually been a small forward up to this point, but he was now the power forward. Sanders, like many of the Celtics, was lauded for his great defense. He was one of the best rebounding small forwards of his time, and he was often the Celtics' second best rebounder, only behind Bill Russell. Satch was a bit of the unsung hero for eight championship teams. Heinsohn once called him the most underrated player on the 60 Celtics. Sanders was mainly asked to put all of his energy into defense, and unfortunately, great defenders aren't really remembered as much as great offensive players. When he needed to, he could score, and this year, he put up 11.8 points and 8.3 rebounds. At point guard was Hall of Famer Casey Jones. Jones, no relation to Sam Jones. Casey had played alongside Bill Russell at San Francisco. The two had won NCAA championships in 55 and 56, and would go on to play together in the 1956 Olympics. In the NBA, Casey won eight championships as a player, and then two as the head coach for the 84 and 86 Celtics. He spent the first five seasons of his career as Bob Cousy's backup, but by now he was a starter. For the last four seasons of his career, he finished top 10 in the league for assists. Casey was also one of the best defenders of point guards in the league. This year, he finished third among all players in assists, with 8.3 points, 5.6 assists, and 4.1 rebounds. And coming off the bench was the Celtics' secret weapon, Hall of Famer John Havlicek. At this point in NBA history, the concept of the sixth man had not been a clear or defined strategy. You would start the five best players you had. Red Auerbach had first utilized Hall of Famer Frank Ramsey as a sixth man in the late 50s and early 60s, but Havlicek took the role to new levels. Havlicek was one of the best all-around players the game has ever seen, able to score, rebound, distribute, and guard every position besides center. Red's plan was to let Havlicek torture the other team's substitutes. Havlicek was the team's second leading scorer with 18.3 points, 4.9 rebounds, and 2.7 assists off the bench. Had steals been tracked, Havlicek may have been one of the league leaders, as he had quite a reputation for being a pickpocket, but more on that later. Another key reserve off the bench was the 6'6 Willie Nall. 
Wells. Willie is one of the great forgotten all-stars from the late 50s and early 60s. He had made four all-star games with the New York Knicks before coming to Boston in 63. In 1960, he became the first black team captain in a major American sport, and he'd go on to win three championships with the Celtics. He had a great five-year stretch with the Knicks, where he was top 10 in points per game, rebounds per game, and free throw percentage. Knowles was a very good free throw shooter, and in 1965, he put up 10.5 points and 4.7 rebounds. Rounding out the rest of the roster was backup point guard Larry Siegfried, future Hall of Fame coach John Thompson as a power forward, rookie small forward Ron Bonham, and rookie center Mel Counts. Last, but certainly not least, was their head coach, Red Auerbach. His fiercely competitive nature and drive to win turned the Celtics into the toughest team of the 60s. Before the season started, however, Boston suffered a tragic loss. Walter A. Brown, who had been the Celtics' owner since 1946, passed away on September 7, 1964. The Celtics retired the number one in his honor, and Bill Russell declared that the Celtics would win the championship. The Celtics finished with a 62-18 record. Up to that point, it was the greatest regular season in NBA history. They also finished with the number one rated defense. Six of the Celtics finished in the top eight for defensive win shares, and and Willie Knowles also finished 15th. Had all defensive honors existed at this time, it's possible that multiple Celtics could have made appearances. The Celtics also had the number one net rating, the number one rated pace, and the number one rated SRS. Boston is often credited with the creation of the fast break. When you combine that with plenty of perimeter defense and Bill Russell protecting the rim, they were almost unstoppable. When the Celtics needed to slow the game down, Russell could get the ball in the post and distribute to one of his outside shooters. An aspect of the 60s Celtics that I used usually don't hear mentioned is how, in a way, they were sort of innovators for positionless basketball. I'm not saying they created the concept, but the Celtics had forwards who could handle the ball, bigger players who could score from the outside, and arguably, their best playmaker was their center. The Celtics only needed to play one Eastern team before advancing to the finals, the Philadelphia 76ers, led by Wilt Chamberlain. Boston took the first game, but Philly took game two. The Celtics won game three, and the Sixers won game four. Boston won game five and had the chance to take the series, but Philly squeaked out a 6-point victory to force Game 7. The Celtics had home court advantage for the do-or-die game. They jumped ahead to a first quarter lead, before losing it at half. They got ahead again in the third, before Philly began making a comeback. The Celtics were leading 110-107 to with only a few seconds left, but Chamberlain got free and dunked the ball to make it a one-point game. Russell decided to inbound the ball, but as he made his pass, the ball hit some guide wire that was on the back of the basket, which counted as a turnover. Apparently, Apparently, that wire had been put up just for that one game. Now the Sixers got the chance to inbound, with one second left on the clock. The Sixers and Celtics moved into position. Bill Russell, Sam Jones, Satch Sanders, Casey Jones, and John Havlicek. Havlicek had played a great game. In 42 minutes, he put up 26 points and 11 rebounds. According to him, what happened next was in slow motion. We have a one-point lead! Career is putting the ball on play. He gets it out. People to Havlicek! Havlicek stole the ball, one of the most iconic NBA quotes of all time. With that steal, Boston won the game and moved on to the NBA Finals. Their opponent were the rival Los Angeles Lakers, but in the first round, the Lakers had lost Elgin Baylor when he went down with a season-ending injury. Jerry West took over and was killing in the playoffs, but Baylor's absence is still the biggest knock against the 65 Celtics. The Celtics won the first game, 142-110. to At the time, it was the most points a team had ever scored in a finals game, and the only team that has beaten that record were the 1985 Celtics, when they scored 148 points. Jerry West was having a great series, putting up 45 points in Game 2 and 43 in Game 3. LA won Game 3 126 to 105, but they proceeded to lose the next two, as Boston claimed their seventh straight NBA championship. In my opinion, Bill Russell deserved the Finals MVP with 17.8 points, 25 rebounds, 5.8 assists on 70.2% from the field. 
field, but Sam Jones was also great with 27.8 points, as well as John Havlicek, who had 18.2 points and 5.6 rebounds. So in conclusion, were the 1965 Celtics Bill Russell's greatest team? They may have the strongest case, but in my humble opinion, I don't think it's open and shut like many people say it is. I think that the 1962 Celtics have an underrated case that isn't often considered. They finished with a 60-20 and 20 record and had 8 Hall of Famers. It's true they had a harder time in the finals and they didn't have John Havlicek, but unlike in 65, they had Bob Cousy, Frank Ramsey, and Jim Loscutoff, as well as a higher scoring Tom Heinsohn. What's really strange is how both teams were taken to 7 games by Wilt Chamberlain in the playoffs, and the outcome of both game 7s were decided by the last play. Maybe that's a video for another day, but in the meantime, share your opinions in the comments, and take care.